some notes to talk about. <laughs> Joe, we, we really appreciate everybody coming, you know, out fighting all those freeways and things today and are staying overnight. Uh, <clears throat> Livermore Valley's been a little special for our family and, and uh, we uh, hope that we'll continue in, in, for another 125 years or so. And uh, I'm happy to see there's some consumers here today. You know, we have a lot of a lot of producers. We need those consumers to get the guy. We say the best bottle of wine is an empty bottle. So uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll continue with that. And, and I remember the first time I in, back in '68.
1964 when I made why 334 cases that one, uh, one retailer said he would take and, and I said, oh, oh my God, you know, that, that was like, uh, you know, 20,000 cases now. But uh, we're so happy and I think there's such a future in this variety uh, and uh, a lot of the experts are here today to tell us uh, where we're headed. So thank you very much and I'll turn it over to uh, this guy next to me. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm John Kincannon, fourth generation, and um, you know my great grandfather. He uh, planted the first uh, varietal petit sirah here back in 1904, and uh, as Dad mentioned, uh, he produced a 1961 vintage, uh, which coincidentally was the year I was born. So that means that um, we're getting ready to celebrate, uh, to my chagrin, uh, 50 years next year of this varietal. So that'll certainly be a be a wonderful year. I'm sure Joe will take uh, full advantage of that uh, for PR for the for the this wonderfully uh, growing varietal. Um, you know, here at, at Kincannon, we're primarily a uh, Petite Syrah winery. We have 200 acres here on the estate, and 160 of that are Petite Syrah. And this facility that we're sitting in today is part of the original 47 acres that uh, great grandfather purchased uh, uh, back in 1883. So I, I think uh, if he's looking Looking down on us right now, he'd be very pleased to uh, see all of us sitting in the same room together. So, with that, um, what I'd like to do is, is kind of go around to my left, and if we could all just introduce ourselves, that would be great. America.com and I'm the winemaker for Winesmith and Diamond Ridge Vineyards. Don Neal, editor, publisher, practical winery maker. Ray Johnson, taste wine. Uh, Eric Stein, winemaker at Lane State Vineyards. Maria Barra, uh, winemaker at Lane State Vineyards, and I'm a partner. Ask Victor Edwards, and the new designer to go on and back on the Carrie Crespo, Stag's Lee Winery, PR. Monica Granato, Small Tech Communications. Gabby Ferris,
Ken Rosalind Blue from uh, Rockwell Land Company, Rosalind Blue Summers, uh, located in the part of the Sarai country, Alameda. <laughs> 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 Yes, we are. Uh, thanks for reminding me, Dad. Uh, actually, uh, we are. We are uh, streaming live uh, on the World Wide Web all the way to uh, on PSILoveYou.org. And I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that if you have a question or comment, just wait for the microphone to come around to you uh, so everybody can uh, that's watching us on the Internet can, can hear your question. So with that, I'm very pleased. Uh, our keynote speaker is a gentleman I had the pleasure of meeting over lunch in Manhattan this past winter uh, during what I think was New York's uh, worst snowstorm in many years. I, they, you know, Daddy, uh, he sends me to the, uh, the, the, the coolest places in the winter and the hottest places in the summer. I don't know if he's trying to tell me something, but uh, I think it was the worst snowstorm New York had back in, what was it, February, Tyler? Um, in like seven, eight years, and uh, Mayor was... Uh, paying $12.50 an hour to anybody that wanted to go out and shovel snow or fill sandbags. So they, they, they literally closed down all the bridges and uh, I think the only appointment I was able to keep was uh, lunch with, uh, with Tyler that day. But um, our, key, our keynote speaker, uh, he has a PhD and he is known on the web as Dr. Vino, where his column can be read at drvino.com. Uh, he talks, teaches, and writes about wine. He's the author of two books published in 2000. 2008. Uh, the first was the backstory of the wine industry in France and America, and the second was a practical guide full of wine recommendations. He has been described as witty, lively, and loaded with common sense by the Chicago Tribune, and I can attest to that by uh, having dinner with him last night as well as our lunch uh, several months ago. He flew in uh, all the way from uh, New York last night, and uh, it is my honor to present Dr. Vino himself, Tyler Coleman.
Does this microphone work any better than the last one? <laughs> How are you doing? It's okay. Sound good? All right, perfect. I'll see if we can get a slideshow to work, too. You know, technology, you can't stick with it, and, uh, yeah, it also can frustrate you. Yeah, you know. So, um, mm. all right, well, uh, our question today is, can Keith Serrano be the next Pinot Noir? This may make you guffaw, and uh, you're welcome to do so if you want, because at face value, they are quite antithetical, these two grape varieties. Yes? Question? I can't hear you. Yeah. This speaker, I don't think this speaker's working down here. We'll give it another try. Any of the speakers are working. I think his mic is broken. That should work. All right, let's see. How are we doing now? No. No? Yeah, we can hear him. Yeah, well, okay, we're good. Good. the front right. is not going through the front. Testing, testing the back. No, so, nothing. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Okay. 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 We're not going to use this one. Oh. We'll swap. Now it's working. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's off. What do you do to it? I think it's a negative ion. It's working with positive. It's testing again. No? It's working, it's working again. It's got a loose wire. Yeah. How about using a little bit? Thank God for technology. Um, hey, hey, this thing does work. How's this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Does this work? Yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. You had to set the next Okay. All right. All right. Well, you should. Uh, if you, if, if you, since you've seen what I can do to microphones, you should see what I can do to uh, some grapes. You know. So. All right. Well. Uh, so yeah, our question is: uh, Can uh, Petit Sirah be the next Pinot Noir? And at face value, that may make you laugh because the two grapes are. Uh, uh, at two ends of the spectrum from a flavor perspective, um, but uh, uh, but there is a reason to ask the question. Can we have the next slide? Um, given the tremendous success of uh, Pinot Noir in the post Sideways era, uh, uh, it is a grape that that a lot of other grape producers may want to emulate. Um, but uh, however, just even though the, the popularity of Pinot Noir certainly uh, came a long way in the last five or six years from uh, Sideways, uh, it may have run its course. Even just last week, uh, Blake Gray, who uh, used to write the wine column for uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, actually penned a breakup letter to Pinot Noir, if you didn't see that, where he, he, he said that he wanted to break up with Pinot because she was getting a little bit fat. Moreover, she was sleeping with Syrah. So, <laughs> so uh, but anyway, um, uh, but yeah, there are a few, definitely, uh, it's an interesting question, and can you tap into that uh, popularity? Um, well, uh, um, I, I, what I want to talk about today is uh, I'd like to talk about three quick case studies, uh, two of which are not from wine and um, one that is, and then also talk about the future of wine criticism and how uh, younger consumers are talking about wine today uh, and why that's important. Um, maybe, can we have the next slide, please? 
All right. Maybe some of you have seen this uh, ad. How many people have seen these Old Spice ads? Well, if you haven't, let's try and run one now. If we just click on TV commercials, it should uh, come up. There's quite interesting campaigns here, so uh, this Can you, oh no, look, you need to get the latest Flash player. Uh, is it, uh, can you click on anything there or not? If it's, if it's not going to work, that's fine. We'll just, uh, we'll just run with it. It's not going to work, that's fine. I can just describe it briefly. For those of you who haven't seen it, it was a campaign that debuted in the Super Bowl and uh, ran through the, the World Cup and still uh, continues today on the internet where it's YouTube's number one uh, top ever sponsored channel uh, with over 111 million paid, uh, views on, their, on this ad campaign. But what it is, they have a couple of 30 second spots with this former NFL wide receiver who is quite a good looking guy and uh, he encourages uh, uh, comparison to the viewer's um, uh, 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 man he says, look at your man and look at me. Look at your man and look at me. Does he look like me? No, but he can smell like me. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, and then it proceeds through all these uh, uh, sort of stereotypically macho uh, uh, activities where he runs through in one take, actually, quite, quite well shot, um, uh, these things of building a kitchen, baking a cake, uh, and ultimately uh, riding off on a horse. And so, uh, quite funny, it's a good send up of, uh, 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 of, of machismo uh, things and, uh, and it's really caused quite a stir on the internet in particular. And so, uh, but, uh, but what they did, what I think is quite interesting um, uh, here is that uh, Procter & Gamble, the maker of, of Old Spice, um, identified women as the key buyers of this body wash that they were trying to sell. And so they made this campaign to, to, to you know, kind of send up uh, uh, this, this machismo uh, image. And um, it, really, it really took off. And so I think that that's a... Uh uh, a, key, a key component to dealing with uh, uh, marketing and being online today is that you have to have uh, wit and be, be funny because generally speaking, um, these people are uh, bored at work and so they like to talk, pass things around. 30 second funny video uh, is, is perfect fodder for that. And so it really took off online. They even, um, they, they really used um, uh, the online aspect um, very, very well for this campaign and they had readers send in questions questions uh, via Twitter and Facebook pages and then this guy actually taped 30 to 60 second responses, uh, video responses to these, um, to their questions and they were very selective in who they replied to actually and they replied to a lot of people who were very connected in the in online world reply to their questions that then they would get further further buzz and so it really has generated uh, a huge amount of um, uh, chatter uh, uh, and it's been widely praised for a very limited budget actually um, and so uh, quite an interesting interesting phenomenon I think uh, as well as being funny so um, he even the, the guy the actor actually proposed to someone for on behalf of someone else so it's quite quite a funny video response so um, but yeah it actually uh, and you may wonder well what what does all this chatter and, and page views add up to? Well, in the case of this Old Spice body wash, it's uh, added up to 107% sales increase in the first six months of this year. So, um, so yeah, a relatively good return uh, and uh, shows you can you can sell anything, uh, I guess, uh, these days, considering that 91 out of 92 uh, of Old Spice products have known carcinogens in them. So, uh, maybe we'll take the next slide. <laughs> Uh, another another example um, is in the uh, from the uh, online world is um, has, is, is in the field of diapers and uh, Pampers actually launched a new diaper uh, that was thinner than before, but it was causing some uh, uh, blowback from consumers, and so uh, a lot of people started campaigning against it on Facebook. Bring back the old thicker Pampers because my baby's got diaper rash and so on. And so uh, so that's interesting. In and of itself, because in the online world, if you're not doing something right, uh, consumers can blog about it, tweet about it, uh, start Facebook pages uh, to, to bring back the old pampers and, and things like that. Uh, 
uh, but Huggies, coincidentally, the, the Pampers rival, um, actually had another campaign, more positive campaign, going at the same time that was quite interesting. And what they did there was to encourage um, uh, so again, to get to know their core consumer, and so they, they in this case, a bunch of uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, moms, they wanted to tap into that and, and empower them, and they actually uh, gave away $250,000 in small grants, ten dollars to $15,000 each, for, um, for I ideas that, that these, their consumers had that, they, that lacked funding, but they thought were, were worth funding, and so they had people submit ideas, um, uh, uh, and they have yet to announce their their awards actually because uh, just campaign just ended. But um, but again, that's quite interesting because instead of sending instead of doing what you might expect them to do, which is send in your cute baby photos and we're going to post those online, they actually said no, we're not even going to make this about our product. We're just going to give away two hundred fifty thousand dollars in in small grants and uh, uh, and try and make the people who use our product happy and, and more satisfied just in their lives. So I think that was quite an interesting uh, uh, campaign from that perspective. Um, so, all right, let me see that. Next slide. And finally, uh, one in the wine industry that happened last year, you may be aware of uh, uh, Murphy Good, a um, Kendall Jackson uh, uh, winery, had an online competition for what they call the dream job of uh, six months running their uh, uh, social media uh, uh, apparatus. And they were going to pay the lucky winner uh, $10,000 a month plus accommodations uh, at the winery uh, to move to Sonoma and run their social media for them and they fielded they got hundreds of video submissions and people could then vote on these video submissions which one they they liked the best and uh, ultimately they chose some uh, finalists and then put those up for a vote as well popular vote and uh, the winner by all accounts I have not met him but it, by all accounts a very nice guy and uh, 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 and actually um, uh, continues to work in the in the social media in the wine industry though not for for Kendall Jackson anymore um, but uh, uh, one one thing was that there was uh, uh, about this campaign is that the, the 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 competition part generated more buzz actually I think than than the six months of doing social media afterward for the winery themselves. So um, anyway, just an interesting uh, three little uh, camp uh, things that have been happening online. Uh, and so maybe now we'll just switch to talk about the future of wine criticism. And uh, times have changed, and this is uh, how you might remember things back in 1999 um, and then in 2010 a little bit more of a somber uh, period right now and this is actually a title the cover of one of my books uh, that has a, a wine and a brown paper bag in it I thought I was going to be the the first <coughs> wine book to ever have the dubious distinction of having wine and a brown paper bag on the cover but uh, I saw that there was actually another book that just uh, that also so the graphic designer thought that was such a tremendous idea uh, uh, for the times, but hopefully it's not um, that bad. Um, and uh, but so nonetheless, the economy has changed and certainly represents a, a headwind right now. Um, uh, but. I think the backdrop is very favorable nonetheless because Americans, despite the recession, are still into wine and want to have wine on the table. And that's a really exciting story because uh, we've had 16 years of uh, consecutive per capita growth in wine consumption in the United States. And, uh, uh, and, so, and so Americans are into wine. Um, could we have the next slide? Thanks. And this is some data from John Gillespie at the Wine Market Council, uh, but uh, some of you probably had heard from him before. He's a great speaker and gives a good presentation, so I don't want to uh, 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 take his, uh, get, re rehash his presentation, but I do think that he has some good data, interesting data. And so when we're talking about getting to know uh, your core consumer, uh, it's really important in the wine market uh, because John's data show that, that the core consumers actually drink 91% of the wine in America. So, um, so yeah. And the strongest growth category in um, the uh, core consumers is uh, the so-called millennial generation. 
which are also known as them there are young folks. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, generally speaking, it's the, it's the people who are aged currently between 16 and 33. So uh, not all of them uh, legally wine consumers, uh, but the, certainly the ones 21 to, to 33 are. Then the next uh, demographic group going up in terms of age would be Generation X, a little bit of a smaller group, uh, then before we get to baby boomers, uh, uh, and then those over 65. So the growth uh, area right now, uh, baby boomers uh, and millennials are, are really looking like um, the very the strongest groups uh, uh, in terms of consumption, but, but millennials are showing a lot uh, stronger growth rate um, as more and more consumers, uh, as younger people start to, to drink wine and try wine. And you know what? They really like wine, young people. Yes, Dan? Can you uh, break that out by dollars I can't. I don't have that data. Sorry. Um, yes? What is a negative number? <laughs> negative growth. Uh, that they're switching for other, other beverages, alcoholic beverages. Yes? So anyway, it's really a, a fascinating um, comparison with Europe, where because in America we see that uh, young consumers really are into wine, and I can tell you, I teach wine classes at NYU, and they have a 70-person wait list, uh, and they're all people. It's, it, most of the people who sign up are uh, under 40, and they're very into wine, uh, very into learning about wine, very experimental. Um, they really see wine education and uh, as as a part of of uh, everyday life now. They really want to learn more about wine. It's got more cachet than beer, and uh, uh, it's also um uh, very fun, and, and you can learn so much about wine. Uh, limitless, uh, a lifelong pursuit of learning. But uh, uh, but anyway, it's quite interesting with um, a contrast that with Europe, where where younger demographics, younger younger folks are moving away from wine actually, and so it's actually um, uh, quite quite a different type of wine market uh, that they have have in Europe now. So we we but we should be um, we're fortunate that that wine is very very popular here. Uh, uh, today with younger people. So, and we're soon to become the largest wine consuming country uh, given our size, even if our per capita rate is still somewhat uh, low on par with Ireland. Um, but uh, uh, So yeah, well anyway, I was just saying that a little bit about, about younger consumers and they are very experimental and they'll try any grape uh, once and come back to it if they have a good time and very open with packaging um, and trying all sorts of different packaging. Uh, younger consumers tend to get a lot of their wine uh, or tend to get a lot of their information on the go uh, with, with uh, smartphones, the uh, rise of smartphones such as the iPhone. Uh, uh, a lot of things are, are, are really on the go. Um, a lot, uh, I, I would be surprised to learn if there was any um, 25, person under 25 who still subscribed to a newspaper. Uh, uh, or, in fact, a uh, person under 25 who wears a watch, um, because uh, again, with your with your with your smartphone, you can get their news edited for you by your friends online, who ping the most interesting articles to you. And of course, the smartphone has a clock in it, so <laughs> watch becomes superfluous since it only does one thing until time. Um, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, it is. Um, uh, and one one final thing uh, that's worth mentioning is the uh, uh, here is the Sierra Gap, as John Gillespie has called it. Uh, this this phenomenon where, in his surveys, um, people in California have a more favorable uh, interpretation of or uh, uh, impression of California wine. Uh, than, than the other 49 states. Uh, uh, and so interesting survey uh, results from, from his data that we can talk more about if you want. Um, but uh, we'll take the next slide, yeah, thanks. So, but for the last 25 years, the model of wine criticism has really been um, uh, several influential publications, maybe one or two, that, uh, that hand down their tasting notes and scores, more importantly, uh, uh, and then consumers gobble those up. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and so that's, but that's been where we've come from in the past couple of 
three decades probably, but where we're going to is a little bit less clear because it, the, the recession has had been particularly hard for media companies. Gourmet magazine actually closed and uh, there have been layoffs at other um, significant publications and so, and certainly it's a uh, much more difficult, much changed landscape now. Sort of a uh, lunar landscape in a lot of ways, not a lot of uh, growth there, but, uh, uh, but, but quite, quite difficult. Um, uh, one indeed. So, as you might expect, then it's a bull market for free content online, uh, and so um, we're we kind of all are, are bloggers now to a certain extent uh, when we contribute to the discussion online of social media. So um, they really. Uh, they don't uh, uh, cost anything to start, and they can generate a good discussion. And uh, uh, and so and so, several wineries have also gotten into blogging and social media uh, effectively. And uh, we could talk about those uh, in a little bit too. Why don't we? So yeah, but but so one criticism uh, uh, in the future is going to have a quite different look to it than wine criticism in the past that we're accustomed to. Um, instead of just having a number uh, or a tasting note handed down like manna from heaven, uh, uh, and then everyone goes and 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 follows that dictum. Uh, actually, what's happening now is it's much more lateral uh, uh, form of discussion, horizontal, where people are actually uh, contesting things and and. Discussing Discussing things, and so it's um, it's a little bit confusing. It's maybe fast moving and difficult to follow at times, but it is um, uh, it is growing, and it is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so, and quite quite a different quite a different model. Um, so uh, it's, instead of um, talking at the readers, as much of journalism uh, has done. Uh, this is more consumers talking among themselves, readers talking among themselves, readers talking with experts, uh, uh, either in comments pages on uh, newspapers, websites, or on forums, or, or blogs, or, or Twitter, or Facebook, for example. How many people have heard of Twitter, by the way? Yeah? All right, all right. Well, it's been on the cover of Time magazine. There you go. So, uh, and Facebook, Facebook, uh, which just had their uh, uh, 500 millionth person sign up. And as someone tweeted about it the other day, uh, uh, um, s Facebook celebrates 500 million people who don't care about their privacy. Um, uh, 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 but, um, uh, but yeah, and so, um, but another question is how do you monetize that? And so some people, um, such as Robert Parker, made the decision recently to put his forums behind a paywall and to make that a perk of uh, subscription. And so.